Did you have a good night last night? I guess you're all the ones who didn't have a good night last night, right? Because you're here at 9 a.m. So <laughs> the ones who had a really good night are still, maybe they're still out in some nightclub somewhere. It seems like there's a few less people here than there were but maybe they'll, they'll come in and we can wave to them as they come in. So, so my extension, you yeah. I went to bed early, yeah. No, I was, I was making slides. That's what I was doing. Um, so I'm very happy to, to be here and I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to come and talk to you. Um, it's, uh, it's great fun to come and do these kind of summer school things or winter schools. Um, some sun in the winter is also, also welcome. Um, so I'm going to talk today, I think, for a total of five hours. So you don't get the relief of having you know, two speakers sharing the day. You're going to have to listen to my voice all day. Uh, so to break it up a little bit, I'd really you know, welcome questions and interaction with the audience up to a certain point. Because I, I do have to get through some slides too. Um, but do feel free to ask questions and interrupt and ask for clarification. And in fact, I, I, um, I'm being treated as something of a VIP at the Leonardo Hotel, and they keep leaving these little boxes of chocolates in my room, which is really nice. Uh, I like chocolate, but I like to make my audience happy too. So I'm, I'm going to give out a chocolate. I've got four little chocolates in this box. And I'm going to give out a chocolate for the best question in each, in each session. <laughs> but I'm going to decide dynamically during each, uh, each lecture whether that's the best question or not. Okay, so we'll, maybe you guys can help me judge what's the best question as we, as we go along. So that's to encourage some interaction, um, but hopefully not too much interaction. So I do have way too many slides, actually. I think I made something like 270 slides or something, right? But, Actually, a bunch of those slides are just biases, showing nice pictures of biases and success rates. They're not really, uh, they're not really very useful for you as, as students. Um, but what I want to say is, I, I expect to get through three of the four lectures. And if we get to the fourth lecture, that's a bonus. If we don't, it doesn't really matter. You can, you know, there's, there's a couple of research papers you can read if you're interested. It's mainly just to kind of get you interested in this area, get you thinking about it, some of the problems. I don't really care if we get to the end of the, of the lectures or not. The other thing I want to say is that. Uh, Tom uh, Rissen Park's talking tomorrow, and it's very much the case that his lectures are kind of following on from, from these lectures. So we had some, uh, we had some fun uh, sorting out who's going to talk about what. And Tom's view of this is that um, I'm going to talk about 1990s cryptography, and he's going to talk about the good modern stuff. Right? So you'll get, you'll get the modern viewpoint tomorrow from Tom. Right? So uh, maybe you should ask all, him all your hard questions tomorrow about how this stuff works. Really <laughs> okay, Tom. No worries. No worries. <laughs> That wasn't a good enough question. <laughs> okay, so um, in this lecture, lecture one, I'm actually going to start where, where Benny stopped on Monday and start to, and develop the theory for symmetric encryption a little bit more, talk a bit more about the security models like NCPA and NCCA that he introduced. So there's some revision here, actually, some recap. Talk a bit more about modes of operation, focusing on CDC mode and counter mode, which Benny also talked about. Uh, talk a little bit about message authentication codes, and then revisit this, this uh, topic of generic composition, which is basically how do I build a, a secure encryption scheme out of a block cipher or a mode of operation and a MAC algorithm. So there are different ways of putting these things together, and what can we say generically about security of, of these compositions. And this is kind of important because it turns out that most of the real world protocols that you use, SSH or IPsec or SSL, TLS, are using basically generic composition. <coughs> constructions in their, in their encryption. <clears throat> so if we understand a little bit about the theory of generic composition, we can start to see how does that apply to these real-world protocols. Okay, and then after this lecture, after lecture one is done, we're really into uh, kind of attack mode, trying to find attacks on, on different real-world encryption schemes like IPsec and TLS and so on. Okay, and lecture four is actually mostly focused on SSH. Uh, we may or may not get there. We'll see how the time is. Okay, so any questions about the agenda? What we're going to be, what we're going to try and cover today? Okay, so nobody gets a chocolate. That's good. Um, okay, so uh, we saw this really uh, the uh, in Benny's talk the other day, the syntax for a symmetric encryption scheme. So this is not a block cipher, right? A block cipher is something we're going to use to build a symmetric encryption scheme. And the, I guess the key difference here is that the encryption algorithm takes a message M in some message space big M. Okay. So this space big M might be all bit strings of a fixed size. It might be uh, all bit strings of, you know, it might be zero one star. It might be some more limited domain. In Tom's talks tomorrow, there will be examples where M is actually, for example, the set of all possible credit card numbers. So a very restricted domain possibilities, okay? So we're going to be encrypting messages from some domain. We have a key gen algorithm, which is probabilistic. It's a good job, it's probabilistic, right? We need random keys. So it's going to give us our key. We have an encryption algorithm, we have a decryption algorithm, 
which either outputs a message from the message space or a failure symbol, failure indicating that something went wrong during decryption. We were not able to decrypt this message. And we have the obvious correctness requirement that for all keys that might be output by the key generation algorithm and for all messages in our message space, if we encrypt the message under that key and then decrypt, we get our message back. Okay? So this says absolutely nothing about security. This is merely about functional correctness, that, that decryption undoes encryption. And throughout uh, almost everything I'm going to say, we're in a stateless setting. So the encryption and decryption algorithms are stateless. Uh, they don't store some kind of internal state, allowing you to you know, encrypt the sequence of messages in some kind of order, or decrypt them in some kind of order. Uh, in practice, stateful algorithms are very widely used. We use things like sequence numbers and so on to, to provide some kind of ordering on our messages. Um, I'm not really going to get into that in these lectures. It's very important in practice, though. And there's also this non-spaced approach to encryption. Instead of using uh, probabilistic algorithms <coughs> that was developed originally by, by Rogaway in 2004, and I think Tom's going to, going to speak to this non-space setting tomorrow. This is a slightly different viewpoint on what symmetric encryption is all about. Okay, so symmetric encryption is what you think it is. All right? But don't think of a block cipher. Think of being able to encrypt messages from some message space. Okay? So any questions about that? Okay, so that's the basic setting. Um, and then this is revision of the NCPA security model that uh, Benny talked about on Monday. So IND means indistinguishable, CPA means chosen plain text attack. I think it's much nicer as a picture. So we have a security game played between the adversary and the challenger. The challenger starts by generating a random bit, so there really should be a little dollar on there, if you're following along the slides, uh, on, the, on the handouts. Uh, we have a key generated by the keygen algorithm. And then the adversary submits pairs of messages to, to, the, to the challenger and gets back an encryption of message MB. Okay, so we fixed the bit B now, and we're always encrypting either the left message or the right message. Okay, message zero or message one from this pair, and we send back C to the adversary. And the adversary gets to do this repeatedly. He makes as many queries as he likes, polynomially many, if you're in some kind of polynomial setting. And at the end, he outputs a bit B dashed, and he wins if B is equal to B dashed. Okay, so this is exactly what Benny talked about on Monday in CPA security for symmetric encryption, right? So you've all seen this. Is, do you recognize it? Yeah? Cool. Good. Excellent. Okay, so we define the adversary's advantage in this security game, or this experiment, to be the probability that B equals B dashed minus a half. So why do we take off a half when we're measuring advantage? Right, he can always guess. He can just output, he could make no queries at all, output a random bit B dashed, and he would be right half of the time, because B was chosen uniformly at random. So to measure his success, we want to knock off that half factor and say, well, you're only going to win if you do better than guessing, essentially. So we normalize by taking off a half. And we say that a scheme is secure, and here I'm being deliberately vague, um, if the adversary's advantage of any adversary's advantage is small for uh, an adversary that uses reasonable resources. Right? So what does small and reasonable mean? Well, if you're, if you're Benny on Monday, then you think of small as meaning negligible advantage in the security parameter, okay? So negligible means smaller than any, the inverse of any polynomial function. Uh, and reasonable uh, would mean polynomially many queries to the encryption algorithm. Okay? Uh, in symmetric crypto, actually, we very often use a concrete approach where we try to quantify the advantage of the adversary and the number of queries and the resources that he consumes. For example, in terms of the number of queries he makes to the encryption oracle, or even the total number of bits that he queries in his messages to the encryption oracle. Okay? And then we try to relate the, the adversary's advantage to, in a concrete way, to the underlying security of the block cipher or whatever that we're using to build the symmetric encryption scheme. So imagine for a moment, if you remember CBC mode, we build a symmetric encryption scheme out of a block cipher, what we'd like to do in a security proof for CBC mode is relate the adversary's advantage, as defined here, for any adversary, to the advantage of some other adversary who's going to break the, the pseudorandomness of the block cipher. And we want to get concrete bounds relating those two advantages. Okay? So we don't just say uh, that it's negligible. We actually try to come up with the concrete bounds. Because we want to, in the end, be able to say, well, you know, if we have this much uh, security for our underlying block cipher, for our PRP or PRF, then we get this much security for CBC mode with this many queries. Okay, that's the kind of concreteness that we want to get. 
So we're going to quantify virtually success probabilities in terms of the number of encryption queries and or the number of bits created to encryption oracle. I'm not going to do this so much today, but this is really just trying to introduce some concepts that Tom will build on tomorrow. Concrete security is important in symmetric encryption. Much more important than you might think. Okay, so this uh, is kind of a computational version of uh, perfect security. Um, essentially, it says the ciphertext leaks nothing about the plaintext. And this is a much, much stronger security notion than, the re than requiring the adversary, for example, to recover the plaintext or to recover the key. So in all of the attacks that you saw yesterday from uh, Illy and, um, and Orr, the cryptanalysis of block ciphers was about recovering the key of the block cipher, right? That's what it meant to break a block cipher. Here we're talking about something quite different. The equivalent notion we would have here is the ability to distinguish the block cipher from a random permutation, okay? So that's the, the strength of indistinguishability notion converts into a different kind of attack on the block cipher from the kind of attacks that you saw yesterday. That's not to dismiss what they were doing yesterday. It's very important to understand the security of a block cipher against key recovery attacks or whatever. Um, but here we're asking for something different from a block cipher. So there's this very famous paper, uh, Balari, Desai, Jokopi, and Rogaway from 1997. It's an absolute classic, and I highly recommend it to all of you to read, um, where they basically developed all of this theory for symmetric encryption. So they developed this NCPA notion, and some equivalent notions, real or random security, find then guess security, FTG, and semantic security for choosing plain text attacks. And they showed that all of these notions were equivalent to each other, <coughs> up to some bounds. Um, and this last notion, SEMCPA, is a symmetric version of the semantic security notion for public key encryption that uh, was introduced by Goldwasser and Carroll in 82. So if you know about semantic security for the public key setting, that's kind of what this NCPA security uh, is giving you for the symmetric setting. It's giving you the equivalent notion in the symmetric setting. And if you don't know this, uh, this semantic security notion for public key encryption from Goldwasser and Michali, then don't worry. Just think of this security game here. That's what we're after for security. Okay? Any questions? Good. Or bad. I don't know. Feel free to ask questions. Okay. So, oh yeah, okay. So achieving NCPA security, and Benny talked about this uh, on, on Monday as well, it's pretty easy if you have a block cipher, FK, with mapping 0, 1 to the end to 0, 1 to the end, so a permutation of 0, 1 to the end. And you use CBC mode with random initialization vectors, or you use counter mode. And these are also all analyzed in this great paper by Bellari, Alpha 97. Um, to get these proofs to work, though, to get the indistinguishability notions, and this is what I was saying before, really, we're going to have to model the block cipher as a PRP or as a, as a PRF. Okay? Recall the definition of a, of a PRP or PRF. The adversary now has Oracle access to one of two objects. The other has Oracle access to the block cipher, FK, for a random K, a fixed K, or he has access to a random permutation. And his job is to guess which world he's in. Am I talking to the real permutation, or am I talking to, I talking to the real block cipher, or am I talking to a uniformly random permutation on, the, on 0, 1 to the end? Okay, so this is the, very informally, is the definition of a PRP or a PRF, and that's the kind of security that we need from our block cipher in order to achieve in CPA security for things like counter mode and CDC. Okay, and you see this definition here, has got, well, it's not really a definition, it's an informal statement of the security of a PRP or PRF. It's got nothing to do with key recovery. Okay? Clearly, if you could recover the key of the block cipher, then you could test. You could compute then FK for yourself, and you could check, am I getting FK, or am I getting values from some random permutation? And you would win the security game for, for a PRP. Okay? But uh, that's not necessarily the only way to distinguish the block cipher from a random permutation. There might be much easier ways to do it. Okay, so if you're a symmetric cryptanalyst who likes to analyze block ciphers and you know extend attacks by one more round, that kind of the kind of bit flipping approach to cryptanalysis, which is very very important, I would say don't worry so much about key recovery. If you want to impress the theoreticians, build distinguishers for your block ciphers. Build distinguishers from from random permutations. It's actually a very worthwhile activity because you'd be breaking the standard notions of security for block ciphers. So, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm getting some fairly... Yeah, some people are not. Good. If one person nods, I'm happy. 
right? If 99 of you shake your heads, I don't care. No, I do, of course. Okay, so here's a reminder of CDC mode. This is, remember, a way of building an encryption scheme out of a block cipher. <clears throat> and it, Benny was wondering on Monday why it's called CDC mode, right? And I shouted from the back, because you're chaining the blocks together. I think he was still a little bit um, mystified. Basically, this here, this little thing here, which takes ciphertext block CI minus one and brings it into play when you're encrypting plain text block PI, is chaining, right? This is kind of a chain together of all the blocks. So if you look at the picture, you see this chain running along the whole thing. That's why it's called cipher blockchain. Okay? Um, so in this mode, we need initialization vector. And what it effectively does is define C0 for processing the very first block. So if you imagine uh, this is P1, so I is equal to 1, there's no P0, but we need a C0 here to get the whole process started. Okay? So this would be this is kind of empty here. So the C0 is, is called the IV. Um, and the security analysis okay, of uh, CBC mode says that if the initialization vector is random, uniformly random, for each message that you encrypt, then CBC mode is secure. Very often in applications, what we see is chained initialization vectors, where the initialization vector for the next message is set to be the last block of ciphertext from the previous message that was sent. Okay, so if you think about using uh, CBC mode to send messages on a secure channel, then you take the last block from the previous ciphertext that you sent on the channel and use that as your IV. That looks good, right? Because, yeah, you know, the last block of ciphertext that comes out, it kind of looks random if it's a good block cipher. Okay? But it turns out that, that that's actually really insecure. And I'll show you later, actually, after the coffee break, why it's insecure. How, and what effect that has on real-world security of TLS, for example. TLS got broken because of chain IDs, in short. Okay. Uh, another thing that really gets in the way for CBC mode, or makes life awkward for CBC mode, is that generally, if your plain text lengths are not a multiple of the block size, yeah? What if you just do one more block and Yeah, that would be fine. You would have to choose a plain text block to encrypt, but you could encrypt L0 block or something, right? Every time, yeah. So the idea is that there's another way of doing this, which is just to encrypt an extra uh, sort of dummy block of plain text and use that as the ID, but never actually send it. Yeah, that would work fine. But that's not what they do. They do this other thing. So they're not a known dummy block, or can it be a known plain text? It can be a known plain text, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, because you can't predict, if, 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 this is a, if this is the all zeros block, and you never send the corresponding ciphertext block, then the adversary really has no information on this block, even though he knows CI minus one, because he sees it on the wire. Yes. sees it in the protocol. Yes? IV, shouldn't, we have to assume that IV is, 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 is unknown to the adversary. So here, what you're saying is that if he won't know the IV, we will be secure. Why IV by itself does not mean it has to be unknown to the adversary. We assume it's secure. Even the IV is known. No, 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 no. Okay. So it's about the fact that the adversary doesn't know the IV before he chooses his next message to be encrypted in the NCPA security policy. Oh. Okay? So it has to be unpredictable to the adversary at the time of the encryption. Okay? And in this attack, I'm going to show you later, that's, yeah, no, no, that's no. violated. This is because you just chosen plain text. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but okay. we'll, come, we'll get there. We'll get there. It might take some time, but we'll get there. Okay, so I was going to talk about padding, and I'm going to talk a lot about padding. Um, some people who know me well think I'm obsessed about padding. Um, but it's important. So it turns out that in the real world, you want to encrypt messages that are not a multiple of the block size in their length. Okay, so our block size is typically 128 bits for AES. You saw AES yesterday, or 64 bits if you're using DES. Well, you know, your password isn't necessarily a multiple of the block size. So you're gonna to have to pad so that you can apply the block cipher in CBC mode. Um, and it turns out that this is very delicate for security. And again, TLS got broken multiple times because of the way the padding was being handled. And I'm going to tell you the whole story of padding in TLS. It takes about three hours to tell the story. It's really complicated, if you really want all the details. OK, um, last thing I want to say here is that, well, the second last thing I want to say is that this paper by Valeria Al, that I've mentioned several times, has a proof of the security of CBC mode. And the proof involves a bound that says CBC mode is secure if the underlying block cipher is a PRP. 
but it involves an additive term in the security bound of this kind of form, q squared over 2 to the n, where q is the number of uh, encryption queries that the attacker makes in its game. So there's a quadratic loss in security. The more queries you make, the, the worse the bound becomes, right? In a quadratic way. And we don't know how to, I think this is probably impossible to improve. I'm not I'm looking at Tom here. Is this known to be optimal, q squared over 2 to the n for CDC mode? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, because of collisions, right? There's, there's, a, there's an attack which says if you go up to, if you set q squared over 2 to the n to be close to 1, then uh, you can find collisions in the block cipher, in the, in the ciphertext blocks, and then that reveals information about plain text. So you can't really do better than q squared over 2 to the n for CDC mode. Yeah, but actually you can also start to do plain text recovery around that, around that bound, it turns out. And here's the decryption, um, which basically says to decrypt block CI, I put CI through the block cipher decryption algorithm, DK, then I XOR with the previous ciphertext block, and that gives me PI. Okay? And for the very first block, uh, I need C0 up here, and there's no corresponding P0 down here. Okay, so we just feed this in, and we're done. Okay, good. And here's counter mode. Okay, and this is, I don't think Benny covered this. Um, I think he mentioned counter mode, but didn't actually show it. There's different ways of defining counter mode, and I've chosen a, a particularly kind of naive, uh, but simple way. Um, so what we're really doing in counter mode is using our block cipher to make a stream cipher. So we have an initial value for our counter, and each subsequent block is encrypted by passing counter plus i, so that's you know, adding them up as numbers, through the block cipher, thinking of the output of the block cipher here as being a pseudo-random sequence of bits, and just XORing that with the plaintext, to get the ciphertext. Okay? And now, what's nice about this is that to decrypt, you also use EK. You don't even have to implement the decryption algorithm of your block cipher to use counter mode. That's kind of cute. If you're in a constrained environment where you don't have enough chip area to do decryption as well as encryption, then maybe counter mode is good for you. Okay? Um, we have to see how we choose this counter, this initial value of the counter for each message that we send. And in the simplest mode, you choose a random value for the counter. Okay, and then you start to, you know, you add zero, you add one, you add two, to encrypt, to encrypt the subsequent blocks of your message. And then for the next message, you choose another random value of the counter. Well, then you have to worry that, well, what happens if two of these values that I'm using in different messages collide with each other? Then I'm going to get the same key stream coming out twice from my block cipher. I'm saying that you might get collisions in this value. Um, and for that reason, you have to be careful not to encrypt too much. Um, you, and you end up, again, with a quadratic loss in the security analysis because of this possibility of collisions if you choose the counter at random. There's a stateful version of the scheme where you keep track of which counters you've used, essentially, okay, in the encryption algorithm. And um, then you only end up with a linear loss in security. So you can make, you can make counter, board, counter mode better than CDC mode in some sense by making the scheme stateful instead of stateless. But that's kind of cheating in this, in this setting. Okay? <clears throat> and, and this is in CPA secure, uh, this, this uh, encryption mode, assuming the block cipher is a PRF. Now why PRF and not PRP? Why do we only need a PR, PRF here? I've told you the answer already, actually. Well, yeah. Yeah, we don't have to decrypt. We don't need this thing, this EK, to actually be a permutation anymore. Just need the outputs to be pseudo-random. So in fact, this could be a hash function, if you like. If you believe that your hash function has pseudo-random outputs. Okay? Or it could be a random oracle, if you know how to instantiate random oracles. Yeah? Anybody know how to instantiate a random oracle? No, I'm <coughs> okay. Um, a nice, another nice feature of counter mode, which we'll finish on on this slide, is that you don't need to pad anymore to use counter mode. If your message, PI, the last block of your message is a little bit short, so it ends here where my laser pointer is going up and down, then you just truncate the output of EK. You don't need to use all the bytes or the bits of output of your, of your block cipher. Okay? So now you don't have to do padding anymore. This is nice. You can do something similar in CPC. You can use ciphertext stealing. Yeah, there's some tricks. But they're kind of nasty to implement. They're standardized by ISO, but they're kind of nasty. It's almost like Yeah, yeah. I never, I never felt very comfortable with it. In fact, it's not actually that way we use in practice. All, all the schemes I know that use CBC mode in, in practice do some kind of padding. Yeah. Okay.
Anybody want to win that chocolate? <laughs> I'm looking for questions. Uh, I can make a remark. Make a remark. One, one advantage of counting mode is random access. <clears throat> That's a good point. Yeah, so I haven't really covered all the nice properties of counter mode versus CVC mode, but if you want to decrypt just the ith block in your stream in counter mode, you just calculate CTR plus i, oh, here, sorry, pass that through the encryption algorithm and decrypt. So you can kind of do parallel decryption, right? It's parallelizable uh, in some sense. And you have random access. You can, you can decrypt any block when you want to. Okay, so that's kind of useful in some, in some settings. Yeah, 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 but you can't do the encryption that way. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. There's, there's all kinds of nuances, which I don't really want to get into. Yeah? So why do we care about other modes of operation if this one is awesome? Well, that's a really good question. So, um, yeah, maybe that's worth a chocolate. <laughs> should, we, should we give him the first chocolate? No. no. <laughs> it's kind of early in the lecture. I tell you what, see if you can do better than that, right? And, and, and we'll see. So why don't we just use counter mode everywhere? So here's one of the reasons that I think, right? Back in the day when people were standardizing all of these uh, encryption schemes, like in IPsec and so on, they were kind of suspicious about the block ciphers that they had. They didn't really trust their block ciphers that much. Now look what happens in counter mode. When I, when, I, when I call the encryption algorithm on consecutive blocks, the plain texts, if you like, that are going into the block cipher, but they're not plain texts here, here's the plain text, but the, the counter values are kind of very closely related to each other. They're perfect for differential cryptanalysis, for example. Okay? Because adjacent counters differ in one bit, the least significant bit. And you know, you can play all kinds of games with that. And so I think people didn't really trust their block ciphers enough to use counter mode. But I thoroughly recommend using counter mode, right? If you believe that AES is, is a good PRF, counter mode's fine. Yeah. And then when we started uh, <coughs> trusting our uh, block ciphers, mm -hmm. then we didn't trust the protocols. Uh, to have a unique uh, initial counter. Well, that's also a problem, um, but it turns out that they screwed up for CVC mode too, right? By using chained IV. So yeah, you kind of it's kind of a yin yang thing. You win some, you lose some. But if you choose it at random, you don't have to trust it. Right? Mm. Have you got some random bits in your back pocket? No, it's not. <laughs> I mean that's an issue. That's yeah. not trusting the random generator. Mm -hmm. That's very true. If you're uh, if you're running on a, running an, a, an application for for a device, you have no idea what the what the <coughs> if you'll have any reasonable entropy on it. Yeah. If in counter mode you repeat the IV or any part of the counter, then you're completely dead. That's true. But in CBC, you it won't be. It's not the end of the world. You have a chance. Yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't use counter mode with random initial counters. I would use a stateful version of it. And make sure that I cycle my key when, if, if the, ever the counter uh, wraps, for example. So there are ways around that too. So yeah, I mean, this, this, this is a, I could give an entire three-hour lecture just on CDC mode versus counter mode, right? But I think it's more interesting to move on. So let's move on. Okay. So motivating stronger security. Why do we want to go further than CPA? Well, of course, you know this already. That in CBC and counter modes, if you have an active adversary, then he or she can manipulate ciphertexts. Okay. So for example, in counter mode, bit flipping in the plain text is trivial by doing bit flipping in the ciphertext. Okay, so if you go back to this picture for a moment, if I bit flip uh, in CI and say bit position zero here on the left, uh, so I change a zero to a one or a one to a zero, I XOR with a mask of one, then I make the corresponding change on PI. Okay, so uh, without knowing what PI is, I can make control changes to PI. Does that matter in practice? Yes. Well, it depends, actually. In general, it does. And we'll see later on an example where it's catastrophic. Okay? But that's the problem with stream cipher as a whole. Yeah. You're not Any stream cipher would have this property. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. And that's why we need better security. Using a stream cipher. So here's the funny thing. Okay, I'll give you the headline now. Using a box or using a mode of operation on its own, um, uh, using encryption on its own, provides confidentiality only against passive attackers. It does not provide confidentiality against active attackers. You need some kind of integrity protection as well. Okay? And we'll see later on how to do that. Okay, so bit flipping is easy. Um, you can also, okay, there's the, there's the headline, here's how you do it. You can also do it in CBC mode, and I'll show you in the next slide, but it's not hard. Okay, or maybe you can create completely new ciphertexts from scratch. <coughs> how could you do that for, uh, I don't know, for counter mode? How can you write down, a, how can you make a ciphertext that will be accepted as valid? It's a kind of a trick question. Right, yeah, write down a sequence of bits. Okay? If you ask for that to be decrypted, it will give you some plain text. You have no idea what the plain text will be, but you can create things that are accepted as being valid ciphertexts. Does that matter? 
Well, it depends, right? I mean, if you can, if you're working in some kind of uh, online environment where you can send messages to a server, it only accepts ciphertexts. You just send it a random sequence of bits. Goodness knows what the server will do in response. Maybe you'll crash the server, right? Because it doesn't parse the incoming plain text properly. Who knows? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then here's bit flipping in counter in, in CBC mode. And I think I've got a little animation here. Yes. If I flip bits in CI minus one, so let's say I pick a single bit and I change it from a zero to a one or a one to a zero, what's the effect on the underlying plain text? What's the effect down here on PI minus one? Yeah, it gets completely randomized because a single bit change here goes through the decryption algorithm, and if it's a good block cipher, that's just going to give you random crap, okay? To use a technical term, all right, at PI minus one. So you're going to corrupt this block. What happens to PI? You change a single bit, right? Because you have an XOR here, I change a single bit here, that single bit delta goes in some sense through the XOR, and you, you can make a control change to PI. So by bit flipping in CI minus one, I can make control changes to PI. Okay? At the cost of corrupting PI minus one. What if there is no PI minus one? Can you think of a situation where there's no PI minus one? Right. In the very first block, remember, there's no P0. There's just an IV. So if I can bit flip in the IV, I can, and the IV you know, is explicit and I've got access to changing its bits, then I can make control changes to the first plain text block in my stream. Okay? At no cost, because there's no P0. There's no corruption. Yeah? Cool. Okay. Ah, moving forward. Oh yeah, quick flips here. Uh, you get whole animation. There you go. Cool. Okay. So these attacks I've shown you, they don't break in CPA security on their own, but they're clearly undesirable if you're trying to build secure channels. Right? You're trying to build, I mean, the most fundamental application of secure symmetric encryption is to build a secure communications protocol so that Alice can send messages to Bob saying how much she loves him or not. That was Benny's example from Monday. More prosaically, so that you can send your credit card securely over the network. Okay? <clears throat> so bad things can happen. The modified plain text uh, might result in the wrong message being delivered to an application, or it might result in some kind of unpredictable, unpredictable behavior at the receiving application. So what we really want is some kind of non-malleability. We want it to be hard for the adversary to change ciphertexts or to, to change the underlying message. We want some kind of integrity guarantee along with our confidentiality. Okay? And there are two basic security notions for uh, integrity in the symmetric setting, and those are integrity of plain texts or int p text and integrity of ciphertexts or int c text. And we're going to define these next. Okay? So here's int p text security. The, um, the attacker now has repeated access to an encryption oracle, as uh, a normal encryption oracle, so not left or right, just encrypt this message for me and give me back a ciphertext, and what we call a try oracle. And the try oracle is just there to judge whether the adversary has won or not the security game. So the encryption oracle encrypts for us under some key, and the try oracle takes any C star as input, okay, and actually it has no output in this formalization. It doesn't give us any output back, um, it just helps us decide whether the adversary has won or not, and the adversary's task, if he wants to win, is he has to submit some C star to the try oracle in such a way that when you decrypt C star under your key K, you get back a message M star that's not the perp symbol, it's not the failure, so C star was a valid ciphertext, and the M star should be distinct from all of the messages M that you queried to the encryption oracle in the game. So in other words, you're forging a ciphertext that decrypts to a different message from all of the messages that you created to your encryption oracle. So how does this correspond to what we were talking about before, about injecting messages into a secure channel? Well, basically, if the adversary cannot win this game, then he cannot write down a random sequence of bits and get it accepted as a new message by the receiver. In other words, he can't forge plain texts. Okay? Is it clear? Who's with me still? Hands up if you're with me. Eh, yeah, some of you. Who's asleep? <laughs> There's some one person. Can you wake her up? There, she's awake now. Good. She's sticking her tongue out at me. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the adversary wins if it can create a plain text forgery. So here's a picture of the game, just to make it more clear. The adversary has access to an encryption oracle, gives him bad ciphertexts under this key K. There shouldn't be a random bit, sorry. You can scratch that. And then you make a submission to the try oracle with some C star, 
and the challenger decrypts uh, to get M star, and you win if M star is not equal to M, and if M star is not parent, if M star is not a failure symbol, right? You have to actually win by submitting a valid ciphertext. So that's in P-text security. <clears throat> and we say that a symmetric encryption scheme is secure, or in P-text secure, if there's no efficient adversary. Okay, <coughs> that's the scheme. Okay. Uh, yeah. All these dots mean do more queries. Okay, uh, so you can mix up your encryption queries and your try queries. Okay. Now, uh, all the, uh, 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 one sec, one sec. He's asking a question. Take turns. Any indication whether the decryption worked or not? Failed or? Oh, I see. Uh, in this version of the game, no, you get nothing back. Okay, there are other versions of the game where so you get the message back or you get an indication of failure, and so on and so forth. So you just send a bunch of six yeah. stars. Exactly. So there are, there are in the version of the game where you only have one access to the tri oracle. You get one query to the tri oracle. The version doesn't need any output, okay, uh, to decide whether it's one or not. But you might get an advantage by learning whether the C star was valid or not valid. So in the multiple oracle, multiple query version of the game, you would generally give the adversary back the output of try, or maybe whether whether C star was valid or invalid, but not M star. Okay, it depends. There are different flavors of the game. And they're all more or less equivalent to each other, up to some factors. So I'm just keeping things simple. Yeah? The adversary sends encryption of them or just message him? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a typo. I'm sorry. It should just be M here. Well spotted. I think that's worth a chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> or not. What does the audience think? Is that worth a chocolate? Yeah. yeah. yeah come on. I've only got four, though, for the whole day, OK? <laughs> Unless they magically give me some more chocolates. <laughs> There's actually a little, there's no, you have to take a random pick because there's no guide in here as to what these different chocolates are. But maybe you can pass, do I trust you to pass that back and not steal, <laughs> not steal the chocolates? Okay. And you can enjoy it now or you can enjoy it later. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Yeah, they're good, they're good, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. You, you work on that question. But don't waste it in this session because that's, this session's chocolate gone, right? You have to wait till the next session. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, this is what I'm saying here at the bottom of the slide. You might have only one access to the tri oracle. You might have multiple accesses. You might get an output from the tri oracle. You might not. There are different flavors of this security notion, and they're all more or less equivalent, okay, up to some factors. Okay, so clearly this is a desirable property of an encryption scheme if we're trying to build a secure channel. It's got nothing to do with confidentiality. Okay, it's about integrity. It's about integrity of plain texts, not a confidentiality notion. Uh, oh, okay. That's funny, my analysis has gone, gone wrong. Okay, now we come to int ctext security, and this is a slightly stronger notion. Um, it's the same as int ptext, but now the only requirement is that c star be a valid ciphertext different from one of the outputs from the encryption oracle. We don't require the underlying message, the underlying plaintext, to be different from all of the messages. Okay, we just require a different ciphertext. Okay? And so here, the adversary is winning if it can create a ciphertext forgery rather than a plaintext forgery. It can come up with a new valid ciphertext that's not equal to any of the ciphertexts that it's seen before, where valid means does not decrypt to the failure symbol, decrypts to some message, some meaningful, well, just some message. Okay? And so the application to secure channels of this concept is not immediately clear, because in a secure channel, we want to prevent the adversary from delivering a new plaintext, right? from injecting plaintexts. We don't really care maybe about injecting ciphertext. But the, the reason for this notion, I think, will become clear later on in a, in a short time. Okay, so I hope it's clear, and if it's not clear, it's your exercise for tonight, that int ctext security implies int ptext security. So if you have a scheme that's int ctext secure, then it's automatically int ptext secure. Can anybody give me the reason why? Can anybody do the exercise in real time? get a tri-oracle for free. Uh, you have a tri-oracle in both games. If it decrypts well, then the ciphertext is valid. Okay, exactly. Perfect. So if, see, if, if you win in the p-text game, you've created a ciphertext that decrypts to some <coughs> new message, well, you've created a ciphertext that's valid. So you win in the c-text game. Okay, so a win for an adversary against in p-text translates into a win against in c-text. Turning that around, if you're secure against in c-text, you must also be secure against in p-text. Okay, so it's really simple. Okay, so quiz question now. This is not worth the chocolate anymore, unfortunately. 
Does counter mode provide in-C text or in-P text security? Which one does it provide? Yeah. Who, thinks, who thinks it provides in P tech security? In C tech security? None. Neither. Yeah, neither. And who doesn't care? Who's just thinking about coffee? Yeah, so you've come to the wrong lecture. You thought you were getting Tom Rissen part today, right? You misread the agenda. Yeah. Got to pay more attention. Okay, so here's a diagram for this one. Again, there's a typo. Let me get rid of this. Ba -da 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 -da. Okay. Right, now we come to CCA security. So we've got CPA, integrity of ciphertext, integrity of plain text. What's the CCA thing? Well, we might want to consider chosen ciphertext attacks now, where the adversary can get ciphertext of his choice decrypted. So imagine a scenario now where, um, you know, you're talking, you're, you've got some online protocol, talking to a server, and I can send a C star to the server and it will give me back any underlying message. Okay? So it's, how many of you know the NCCA notion already for, say, public key encryption? Quite a few of you, right? So it's the analog, okay, of that. And why do we introduce this? Well, the lazy reasoning is that, well, ha, this is what we did in the public key setting. We should do it here as well. Okay, that's kind of the lazy thinking. Um, but actually, in extreme cases, an attacker may actually have this capability in practice for the symmetric setting. There might be some protocol where you can actually send a message and see the output from the decrypting party, okay? Or it might be approximated in practice. You might not exactly get a decryption oracle, but you might get some kind of, you might get some information back from the server. For example, you might be able to observe the reaction of the server, the decrypting party, when you send it an adversarial chosen ciphertext. Okay? So you send a C star to the server, the server tries to decrypt it, maybe it sends back an error message, or maybe the server crashes, or maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe the server. <clears throat> um, hangs for a short period of time, okay, and you can measure that time, okay. So what we're doing here is uh, building an approximation in some sense. It's an over approximation, and this is what we do in, in, in cryptography. Okay, we build models that are maybe very strong because they encompass a lot of possibilities for what might happen in the real world. Do you want to ask a question or a comment? A uh, question. Yeah. Actually, is there any practical use for NCPA? Any practical use? Any pra does it approximate any <coughs> practical use case? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Let me, let me think about that and come back to you. Does anybody else have an, in the audience have an opinion? For me, NCPA is like a tool for proving stronger security properties. It's a stepping stone to proving stronger things. I can't think of a really good use case. I mean, the problem is that in the real world, lots of people think that NCPA is good enough because, hey, it's, it's encryption. We're done. But in the real world, you know, that's, that's one of the points I want to make, that NCPA is really never enough uh, in, in, most, in most situations, I would guess. In disk encryption, it might be not. Yeah. Encrypting files on a disk. And yeah. You want to put the password, you can get it. Once you have access, you have access to everything anyway. And if you don't, and you can't use any decryption oracle anyway because you can't ask it to decrypt. Right, maybe, yeah, possibly. Actually, there's yeah. a lovely recent attack on uh, CBC with this encryption. Oh, <laughs> who's that by? I forget. Some did. Okay. Mm. Okay, so the motivation for NCCA at the moment then is that something like this might happen in practice. You might get some kind of approximation to a decryption oracle in practice, in some real setting. And indeed you, you do, uh, in, in secure network protocols like IPsec, SSL, TLS, and SSH, if we ever get there, okay, I'll explain, that you kind of get partial information coming back from your decryption queries. You don't get the message back, you get some kind of side channel information, timing or an error message or something, which you can see, okay? <clears throat> So this provides pretty powerful attack opportunities. If I can send arbitrary ciphertext and see what happens. So here's the picture. Uh, let's just skip over this, okay. Okay, so here's the picture. The adversary, the challenger chooses a random bit. Uh, it accepts, oh, I forgot to generate a key, so you should generate a key here. We choose pairs of messages as the adversary. We get back the encryption of MB. We get the ciphertext back, and we can also submit ciphertext of our choice to a decryption oracle. It will, the, the challenger will decrypt for us and give us back the message, if there is one, or, or a failure symbol, if it's, if it's a failure, and so on. And we can interleave these queries. We can encrypt and decrypt as much as we like. Okay? There's one restriction, though, which is that we're not, for any C that we get back here, 
from the challenger, we're not allowed to submit it as a decryption query. Okay? Can you see why? Well, I've not told you what the objective is yet. The objective is to, to win if you output a bit B dashed, which is equal to the hidden bit B, the challenger's hidden bit. Okay? So now can you see why I'm not allowed to take a C and submit it for decryption to the decryption oracle? It's trivial. Yeah, okay, it's so trivial that you can't answer it. I understand. Sometimes it's hard to formulate an answer to a really trivial question. But for those of you for whom it wasn't trivial, okay, the idea is that, well, I could choose M0 different from M1, get a C back here, then submit it here, and I would now get back either M0 or M1, and I would know whether B was 0 or 1, and I would have won the security game. Okay? So I have to forbid certain queries to stop the adversary from winning trivially. If you're familiar with the public key setting, this just means you're not allowed to decrypt the challenge ciphertext. Okay? But here we have multiple challenge ciphertexts effectively, because we get to call this oracle, this encryption oracle, as many times as we like. Okay? So we have to rule out the trivial ones. Okay. And uh, let's go back for a second to this previous slide. I wanted to say here, all the basic modes of operation are insecure in this model. And this is an exercise for counter mode. So can anybody do the exercise in real time? Why, why is counter mode insecure in this model? Just flip the last bit. Yeah, flip a bit of the ciphertext. Now I have a new ciphertext, not something that was output by the encryption oracle. I can ask for it to be decrypted. And the message will be the original message with one bit flipped. And now I can tell whether that was M0 or M1, and I've won. OK? So it's trivial to construct attacks. If you don't see that, it's worth actually doing it, you know, just to convince yourself that, that it can be done. Okay, so your basic modes are insecure. Similar attack for CBC mode involving bit flipping in the IV, for example. Okay. <clears throat> so our basic modes are not going to achieve this security notion for us. We're going to have to do better. Now I want to introduce a, a, a fundamental relation, and this is from another classic paper by Bellari and Namprempere that was published at uh, AsiaCrypt 2000, okay? probably the best ever paper published at AsiaCrypt. No, no insult intended to anybody in the audience. A question in the back. Is it safe enough? Ah, well, that's a really good question, but I don't have any chocolates left. Um, and no, is the answer. <laughs> and, and I'll explain why in a few slides time. So let's hold the question. If I don't answer it, um, wave at me, and I'll, I'll make sure I'll answer it. I'll try to answer it. Okay, so here's the fundamental relation. So in this paper, Bellari and Ampere did a bunch of things. They explored the, the relations between C-text and P-text and CPA and CCA and various other things, and they also studied generic composition, Mac and Encrypt, Encrypt and Mac, Encrypt and Mac. Okay? Um, so it's a really classic paper, well worth it. It's the second paper you should read after BDJR97, if you're getting into this area. So their relation says that if you have a symmetric encryption scheme, that is in CPA secure and in CTEC secure, then it's automatically in CCA secure. Okay? So in CCA security is implied by these two uh, other security notions. And in general, these are quite easy notions to, to prove for a scheme. Okay? For a given scheme. So if you want to prove in CCA security, generally speaking, you're better off proving these two relations individually, and then in CCA security follows automatically. So how does this work? Why is this true? Well, here's the intuition for the proof. Imagine you're in, uh, in this uh, adversary challenger picture, and let's call that game zero. It's the normal NCCA security game against the submission encryption scheme. Okay? So in that game, the challenger has to answer encryption queries and decryption queries. And what we do is we hop to a new game, game one, where we just reply to all of the decryption queries with a perp symbol or a failure symbol. Okay, we basically say to the adversary, any C star you've come up with, or any C prime you've come up with, that you want me to decrypt, it can't be valid. I'm just going to answer with the failure symbol. Okay? Now, it's not hard to see that game zero and one are identical, unless there's a related adversary that you can build out of our existing adversary, which actually wins the in-c-text game. Because if, you answer, if, the, if the answer should not have been perp, but should have been some message, then that means the adversary has actually managed to forge a ciphertext which decrypts to a valid message. It wasn't something that was output from its encryption oracle. Okay? So you can hop from game zero to game one assuming the scheme is in CTEX secure. Because if it's in CTEX secure, then no adversary could ever come up with a ciphertext that decrypts to anything other than per. Yeah? So that's the first hop. 
Now you're in game one, where actually you're just simulating the decryption oracle by answering perp the whole time, or failure the whole time. Well, you can simulate that perfectly with an NCP adversary that just handles the encryption oracle. There's really no decryption oracle to handle anymore. Okay, so in two hops, you can prove that NCPA plus NC text implies NCCA security. Okay, and this proof is, uh, is in the paper by Brian Ampripri, um, so if you didn't get it from this kind of sketch, the details are there. And it's, it's well worth reading. It's a really nice paper. And it's yes. only for symmetric or it's for both? Sorry? It's only for symmetric or it's for both? <coughs> symmetric and public key, you mean? Yeah. Or, well, there isn't a public key notion of integrity of ciphertexts. Because the P is public, so anybody can encrypt and create ciphertexts. Right? So there's a similar relation probably for sign encryption. But we don't want to talk about sign encryption. <laughs> it's a really ugly primitive. Right? Sorry to anybody who's worked on sign encryption. I, I include myself. OK. I want to note one important thing here. This proof doesn't work anymore if decryption could return more than one error message. Here we've made the assumption that Either you get back a single failure symbol or a message. But in the real world, decryption schemes can fail in more than one way. The padding might be bad, or maybe a Mac isn't correct, or something. Okay? And this proof doesn't work anymore in that setting. Um, so this is a little bit of advertising for a paper of mine. And others, Baldreva, uh, De Gabrielli, me, and uh, Martin Stamm from FSC 13 where we say, well, hang on, in the real world, we really have to handle this issue. How can we rescue this result for the, for the real world with multiple different error messages? Okay? And we have some kind of, we prove some relations. We basically redo Bilari and Ampenpre, but with this, in this new setting. And there's some funny things that happen. It's a, it's a nice little... Ah, good question. What if I don't have any chocolates left? So the question is, does NCCA imply NCPA plus NC text? Well, you can partly answer that question. NCCA clearly implies NCPA, right? That's obvious. You just you don't need the decryption oracle. But it turns out that NCCA does not imply NC text. There are separations. So you can you can come up with schemes that are maybe a little bit unnatural, where it's clear that they're NCCA secure, but they're certainly not NC text secure. So can you think of a separating example? PKI. Sorry? Oh, PKI you just said. PKI. Yeah, ah, but we're in the symmetric setting. You're not allowed in this room. You're not allowed to step out of the symmetric setting. Okay? And a special ciphertext of all zeros. Yeah. What happens to that? That, that, that always decrypts to all zeros. Right. right. That's all. Right. And it's never produced by encryption, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So now anybody, the attacker, can write down a valid ciphertext, just the all zeros. Right? <laughs> you can always forge a ciphertext. It will decrypt to zero, and that doesn't help him win any kind of NCCA game. Right? He doesn't help him distinguish M0 from M1. He doesn't leak any information about the key, for example, such as ciphertext. Okay? So it's trivial to take a scheme that's in CCA secure and augment it with this dummy ciphertext such that it's still in CCA secure, but you completely break integrity of ciphertext. Okay? So in CCA does not imply integrity of ciphertext. Is this implication still true if uh, we have several uh, error messages? This implication here? No, it's no longer true. That, and that's the point I'm making here. This proof doesn't work anymore. You can, and, and worse, yeah, sorry, it's not just that we can't prove it, there are counter examples. Yeah, there are separating examples too in the multiple error message setting. Exactly. Um, you might say, well, okay, maybe, maybe we asked for too much. Does, so in CCA, would it imply int p text? Integrity of play texts? So trying to go in the reverse direction, but to something a little bit weaker. So does NCCA imply NCPA plus int p text? What do you guys think? Well, you could have already gave us the answer. Yeah. Right? Again, the adversary, with that same scheme, it's a, it's a funny looking scheme, but it's a valid country example, the adversary can write down a ciphertext that decrypts to a, a new plain text, the all zeros plain text, that he never queried to his encryption oracle. Okay, so NCCA does not imply NCPA plus int, C text, int P text. So NCCA, this goes to the question that was asked by the chap in the back row, is NCCA strong enough? Is it the right security notion? Well, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to build secure channels where the adversary cannot inject his own messages, then it's not strong enough, right? Because it does not imply any integrity notion. 
It does not imply in C text and it does not imply in P text. Okay? So if you're trying to build secure channels, in CCA is not good enough. Okay? Now there's a there's a chap there who's fast asleep. I think you want to give can you just give him a bit of a prod for me? He's really gone, isn't he? Oh there he's, he's with us. You're back in the room. You're back in the room. No problem. Okay. So I've got a diagram that summarizes these relations. George, do you have a question? Um, if we have in CCA and integrity of plain text, uh, do we get in CCA to do? Okay, another good question. Does in CPA plus int p text imply in CCA? Remember that int p text is weaker than in CCA, uh, is weaker than int c text. So it might be enough to still imply in CCA. Any ideas? Well, it turns out the answer is no. It's not strong enough. There are schemes which are in CPA secure and they're in PTEX secure, but they're not in CCA secure. Uh, go ahead. Another question about a specific example where you encrypt all the all zeros, all zeros. Yeah. Is this in CPA secure? Because you can put this message in another message and you can distinguish. Only for the Yeah. The message is only a Yeah, it's not it's still in CPA secure. And if you don't like that example, there are, there are, there are ones that are even slightly more natural, which I'll I'll maybe tell you about them in the break if you're interested. Um, so I was asking for a counterexample to int CPA plus int P text implies in CCA. Maybe it's a slightly trickier thing to try to find. Imagine you have a scheme where you first MAC the plain text and then encrypt using an NCPA secure encryption scheme. Okay, so it's a MAC then encrypt construction. It's clearly int p text because you're MACing the plain text. So it's hard without forging a MAC to come up with a, another MAC on an existing, on a, on, on a, sorry, to come up with a MAC on another message. Okay? And it's in CPA because, well, the last thing you did was encryption, so the ciphertexts are, you know, they're just the output of some in CPA secure encryption scheme. But, okay, so we take that scheme, and then we augment it in a certain way by adding a bit, an extra bit to ciphertexts, and we, uh, what do we do? We say, we say that we don't care about the value of that bit. Okay, so it can either be a zero or a one, and it will be ignored during decryption. Okay, that augmented scheme is still in CPA, and it's still in P text, but it's no longer in CCA, because I can take a ciphertext and I can flip that bit from a zero to a one. Now I made a new ciphertext. I can submit that for decryption, and it will decrypt. Okay, and I didn't violate in P text in doing that. Okay, so this is great fun, right? You can, and Barry and I can prepare for a school of these kinds of uh, cleverly constructed schemes that provide separations. So you, it's a good, you, can, you can play around with this stuff, it's a lot of fun. Good, okay. So actually what we're going to do now is we're going to define authenticated encryption to be the combination of NCPA plus NCTEXT, okay? And this is often easier to prove uh, these individual properties than it is to prove NCCA directly. But we also saw that actually NCCA, if we're trying to build secure channels, NCCA is not enough because it has no integrity guarantees. Not really, okay? There are these funny counterexamples. So AE security has become the kind of de facto security notion for uh, secure encryption, for, for uh, symmetric encryption schemes. It's the ultimate goal that we have. We might get there via CPA security and integrity of cybertext and so on, but this is usually our end goal. Why? Well, partly I think it's because of that relation on the previous slide. In CPA, in CPA plus in C text implies in CCA, okay? And people think in CCA is what they want from a symmetric encryption scheme. I'm trying to convince you that that's not really what you want. What you really want is AE. You want integrity of ciphertexts and you want in CPA because in combination they give you strong security guarantees about what the adversary can do against your scheme. He can't forge ciphertexts, he can't inject messages into your secure channel, and he can't learn anything about underlying underlying contexts. You can't distinguish <coughs> encryptions of M0 from encryptions of M1. Okay, so AE is your target. It took a long, long time for the research community to, to realize this, actually. That this is really what we want from symmetric encryption. Okay, and in the practitioner world, they're only just learning that now. 
right? It's taken even longer. You still have arguments on IETF mailing lists about whether we want this or whether we want something weaker. Okay, okay, so here's basically the various separations that I was talking about that came out in question, so we can skip through this. Basically, nothing implies anything else. Okay, that's the summary. Okay. Uh, okay, there's also a very nice all-in-one notion. So we have AE is in CPA plus in ctext. We can have an all-in-one security notion for AE, which kind of combines these two things together. So in this notion, this combined notion of security, and I think, Tom, are you going to use this tomorrow? More or not? Yeah, I'm not I'll go quickly. This is Tom, by the way, here. This little dude. <laughs> now it's Tom's clip art, which I've, I've borrowed without asking him. You don't mind if I use your clip art, do you? Okay. So in this uh, uh, setting, we have two worlds. Uh, the real world and the random world, in some sense. And in the real world here, uh, the adversary is has access to an encryption oracle, which encrypts, that should be, oh yeah, no, okay, no, I'm getting myself confused. In this world, we always encrypt M1 when the version submits a pair of messages and we return the ciphertext. And also in this world, we have a proper decryption oracle, which always decrypts our message, our ciphertext and returns the message, which could be a failure signal, okay? So this adversary is very happy. He hasn't got a mouth for some reason. I'd like to put a little smile on him. Okay, and then over here in this world, Instead of getting the encryption of M1, we always get the encryption of M0. And instead of properly decrypting, we always just return the perp symbol, the failure symbol. The ciphertext was not valid. Remember that these adversary, this adversary is always uh, forbidden from taking a ciphertext here and submitting it to his decryption oracle here. Likewise over here. You can't take a C here and then send it to the decryption oracle. Otherwise, you can win too easily. So the trivial queries are disallowed. Okay? The trivial wins are, are ruled out. And what you can show is that this notion of authenticated encryption security is equivalent to the combination of in CPA plus in ctext. And the equivalence is very strong, it's a one-to-one, -one. there's no loss in the security reductions. Okay? It's a tight relationship between the two. I'm not going to prove this now, um, but it's a, fun, it's a fun exercise to do. Okay? So quite often you'll see this used in research papers, particularly after about 2005-2006 this notion is used. And this was introduced, I think, by Rogaway and Shrimpton in their DAE paper from yeah. Europe 2006. Yeah, another great paper that you should, you should look at. Okay, so I want to show this diagram, the relations between these security notions, and we've kind of explored this diagram already. So at the top, we have this strong notion of authenticated encryption, which is both CPA security and integrity of ciphertexts. That implies in CCA, but is not implied by in CCA, so there's a separation. And of course, in CCA implies in CPA, but is not implied by. So it's strictly stronger than in CPA. Okay? So you should be happy with this, this side of the diagram, I hope. This implication here is from the Blarry and Amprimpe paper. And the reverse separation we did as an example in answer to our question. What about on this side? Well, you can show that this notion does not imply, oh sorry, implies this notion. And that's obvious because in CPA implies in CPA and in ctext implies in ptext, so you're done. Yes? So, just to make sure I'm not misunderstanding. Yeah. In ptext is like saying to secure maps. Uh, right? Essentially. Yeah, kind of. So defining, so if you were to define something that it's authentic encryption if it's in CPA and a secure map, it's actually not strong enough. That's right. That's right, that's my argument, yeah. Yeah, because there are examples that would enable you to write down a ciphertext that decrypts to something that you didn't query to your encryption oracle. You'd be able to inject plain texts. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, uh, and there's a separation this way, and that's because in ptext is strictly weaker than in ctext, basically, so that's not difficult to show. And then clearly, uh, this in cpa plus in ptext implies in ptext and you can separate in the reverse direction. This is a very easy separation to do. Uh, just take a scheme that just max the plain text. It doesn't have any confidentiality properties, but it's certainly in ptext secure. Okay, so that's easy to do. Yeah, sorry, this slide is not in your slide packs, so you might wanna, you might wanna write this down or take a photo. I could stand beside it if you like, and <laughs> I could look kind of glamorous for a moment. If you want. Do you wanna take a picture now? Go, go ahead, quick, quick. Oh, too slow, sorry. Okay, oh, go on, go on then. Are you ready? 
No, too slow. <laughs> All right. No, I'm just messing around. Okay. Then we have the separations going across the diagram as well. None of these notions imply each other, basically. You have these two pairs of separations in both directions. Okay? And this is pretty much the complete picture. And all of the separations are kind of artificial, but that's okay. We're allowed to play those games in this provable security world, right? We don't have to have meaningful separations. <laughs> we just have to work. Yeah, that was a joke. Hmm. How are we doing? When am I supposed to take a coffee break here? Half past? Mm -hmm. We started a little bit late, though, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You could punish everybody for that. Yeah. It's the bus driver's fault. Okay. Now I want to come to uh, another related concept, AEAD. So going further, this is authenticated encryption with associated data, AEAD. And so what, what happened is we did all this work to define AE, and then we realized it wasn't what we really wanted for applications. We wanted something even further extended than this, where basically in a lot of protocols, we want to encrypt part of our data, but some of the data has to be sent in the clear. But we want it to be integrity protected at least. So can you think of an example, a real world example? Where you, yeah, IPsec. In IPsec, you want to encrypt maybe the payload of your IP packet, but you can't encrypt the header because then you couldn't deliver the packet to its destination. If you encrypted the, the destination IP address, you wouldn't know where to send the packet. Okay, so you'd like the IP headers to be uh, authenticated or integrity protected and the payload to be encrypted. Okay, that's a, an example application. In fact, this comes up all the time. TLS has the same requirements. You want some header fields like the length to be integrity protected, but you want the, the body of your uh, TLS message to be encrypted. Okay, so this is driven by, by applications. Here's some applications. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. It's very important, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's difficult. Okay, but you can imagine kind of what the definitions would look like, right? There are fields that need to be integrity protected and others that need to be confidential, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Okay, so what I've not shown you, actually, is how to get to AE. I've talked about it a lot and how important it is, but I've not shown you how to actually construct schemes that achieve this security notion, AE security. What you know is really what you want to do is, is get in CPA plus integrity of cyber texts. Okay, that will get you there. So we need to find a way of, of, of achieving these uh, security properties for our scheme. Okay, so to do that, we need to use Max message authentication codes. And Benny talked about this on Monday, so I'm going to go super fast through this. Uh, this is a symmetric analog of digital signature, so stepping outside of the symmetric room for a moment. Right, we're back in the room, back to the symmetric world. Okay. So the syntax, we have a key generation algorithm, we have an algorithm called tag that generates max or tags, and we have a verify algorithm that input, takes us into a key, a message, a mac tag, tau, and output zero or one. Okay, telling us whether the, the tag was correct or not for that message. So here's a picture. The key security requirement is unforgeability. And there are two flavors of unforgeability. There's normal unforgeability, sometimes called weak unforgeability, and there's strong unforgeability, okay? Uh, and the basic idea is that we have access to an oracle which gives us MAC values on messages of our choice. So we can tag messages of our choice. And after having used that oracle for a while, what the attacker should do is come up with, well, we should come up with either, in the normal or, or the weak case, a tag for a new message that he didn't query to the oracle. So that's a forgery. Or he should come up with a new message and tag pair, okay? Which means that uh, uh, either the tag has to be new for an existing message, or the message has to be new, okay? It's different from one that he created to his tag. That's what this is saying here, okay? So we have either so in strong unforgeability, um, we have to have it could be a new Mac tag on a possibly already queried message, and in weak unforgeability, we ask for a new a Mac tag on an unqueried message, on a message that he didn't create to his tagging oracle. And these are called soft CMA, strong unforgeability under chosen message attack, and WUF CMA, or weak unforgeability under uh, chosen message attack. Okay, and usually the W is, om is omitted. And in fact, in Benny's talk, I don't think he even distinguished between uh, strong and weak unforgeability. But it turns out to be a sort of important distinction, at least in my head. 
Excuse me, why do we need the tag? Sorry? Why do we need the tag? Why do we need the tag? Okay. Uh, the MAC tag is the thing that's going to accompany the message. That's going to allow us to verify whether uh, the message has been modified or not by potentially by an attacker. Tag, not MAC tag. Tag, regular tag. Tag, yeah. yeah. Oh, this algorithm. Ah, sorry. You might want to call this uh, MAC instead of tag. Okay? Or MAC generation. Oh, okay. This is the algorithm that takes the message and the key as input and gives you the MAC tag as output. Okay. I thought it's the counter or something like that. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this is, the, this is an algorithm. You could tell because it was in a white box. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for that. Yeah. yeah. You're quite right. It's not so clear. Yeah, that's kind of maybe not the standard name that people would give this thing. Okay, so MACs, uh, this is just kind of formalizing the. The oh no, this is from this is how to build Max from PRF. So this is something else. So if we have a PRF, its output on a given message input is unpredictable to 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 an outsider who doesn't know the key. Um, and what that means is that a PRF is a Mac because if you can't predict the value of the PRF, then you can't forge, you can't come up with the correct value not uh, on, on a new message. Okay. So in a kind of trivial way. Um, uh, PRF gives you a Mac. And in fact, it's often assumed implicitly or explicitly that, that actually the secure definition for a Mac is not weak or strong in forgeability, it's that a Mac acts like a PRF, that a Mac is a PRF. And you often get confusion in the literature because of this, okay? Um, we have the slightly weaker notion. Okay, here's an example of a Mac. This is HMAC, and I got this picture from Wikipedia, so it's not exactly correct, but it's close enough. <laughs> okay. So HMAC is a beautiful algorithm that builds a MAC from any hash function. Okay, the hash function needs to have certain security properties that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, but here's how it works. So what do you do? You take your key, okay, and you do two funny transformations of it. You, you take the key and you kind of pad it out with zeros, and then you XOR it with some bit string which is called iPad. Okay, and this is defined in the algorithm what exactly this bit string is. It's a fixed bit string. And this gives you some value, okay, a 64 byte value, always. And you do the same thing, but you do it with something called O pad. So I stands for inner, and O stands for outer, inner and outer padding. Okay, and what this kind of gives you is two different keys, right? This is a way of making two keys out of one. It's cheating, actually, but anyway. And now what we do is we take our message that we want to Mac. And we uh, prepend it with this first modified key that's coming from here. Okay? And we pass it through our hash algorithm. Here it's SHA1, but it's any hash function in general. And this gives us what Wikipedia calls a hash sum1. Okay? It's a hash value. It's not a sum. Right? It's just a hash. And we take that hash and we add it onto the end of the other key value. And we pass it through the hash algorithm again, any hash algorithm, to get another hash output. And this is our MAC value, okay? So if you work out the size of the things for HMAC uh, with SHA1 as the hash function, because SHA1's output is 20 bytes, you end up with a 20 byte value down here. So your MAC tag would be 20 bytes long. You could truncate that if you wanted, down to 16 or something, okay? So it's a very simple algorithm and it's very uh, fast because you're doing essentially here one pass over your data using your hash algorithm to give you this. And this is going to be small. So this second pass here generally only involves a very small computation. It's not over a long message. It's going to be over a very short message, generally. OK? So it's pretty efficient. The cost then of tag generation, tag computation, and also verification. Oh, I didn't show you how to do verification. You take your message and your key, you do this process again, and then you compare the output here to the, to the claimed tag value and see if they match or not. So it's pretty fast. <coughs> But it's pretty slow, actually, compared to more modern algorithms like uh, Poly 1305 or UMAC or something. What I like about HMAC is that um, it's a very, a very early example of the triumph of provable security. So here was a scheme that was developed in the mid-90s by Valery, Canetti, and Kravchuk. They uh, did security proofs. They actually proved that it's a PRF, uh, assuming uh, some properties of the, of the compression function of the hash algorithm. Okay? Um, there's a refined analysis by Valari in 2006, and there's also a critique of this analysis by, uh, who's it by? Menezes, because actually this analysis I think requires a non-uniform adversary or something, I can't remember exactly, but 
Anyway, um, it came with a security proof, and these guys, BCK, also wrote an RFC. They wrote an internet standard for their Mac algorithm. They got it standardized, they got it published, and then everybody started using it. So in almost any secure network protocol you look at, HMAC is the thing that people are using. Okay? So it's an early triumph of Google security for that reason. It came with security proof. It was developed by very famous and good cryptographers, and uh, everybody's using it. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, ask. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't a single hash function be enough? Ah, oh, wow, well, gosh, no, that's an advanced question. Um, I guess because you couldn't get the security proof to work. <laughs> uh, but it would also be vulnerable to extension attacks. Yeah? So I could, if, if this wasn't here, okay, and I took this here, then I could add blocks on the end here, and I would be able to extend the, because of the way the hash functions work with chaining, I'd be able to extend the hash value. Okay? So, huh? Yeah. Okay. So a, a key here and a key over here as well. Okay. Yeah. So there's your answer. You can fix it. Okay. But it doesn't remember the key point is the second hash doesn't cost very much in terms of time because it's always on a short input. It's 64 bytes plus 20 bytes. Say. Okay. So it's going to be two compression functions. Okay. Any other questions or comments about HMAC? This does. HMAC does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's, yeah. that's an advanced thing, right? Wow, it messes up this moment. That's true. That's true. Okay. Okay. So back to uh, this question of how do we build an authenticated encryption scheme? I'm going to run over by five, ten minutes. Hope that's okay because we started late. Right? Um, so Valerian and Ampere then considered how do we combine. Um, in CPA encryption schemes and MACs, which are either strongly or weakly unforgeable, to get AE or NCCA. Okay, really, where AE is our target, remember. Um, so there's three basic ways of doing it. There's encrypt then MAC. I think Benny covered this on Monday as well, so this is kind of revision. I don't have a picture, like Benny, unlike Benny. But basically, encrypt then MAC does what you think it does. You encrypt your message using your symmetric encryption scheme, your base scheme, to get a ciphertext. And then you pass the ciphertext through the MAC algorithm, okay, to give you a MAC tag. And then what you send, or the, the final ciphertext, is the original ciphertext together with this MAC tag, right? So it's what you think. It's very easy to prove that it achieves AE security. Uh, it's clear in a sense because the MAC on the ciphertext gives you what? In C text, right? If I MAC my ciphertext, it's hard for the adversary to forge ciphertexts if the MAC is secure. A wrinkle, you need strong unforgeability for your Mac at this point. Okay, but that's easy to achieve in practice. And uh, so that's why it's in CTEX. Why is it in CPA? Well, the base scheme that you started with was in CPA, and now we're adding a Mac on the ciphertext. That can't possibly leak anything about the message, so you get in CPA pretty much for free. Okay, so it's very easy to prove. Here's why. Uh, yeah, and for the strong affordability of the Mac, well, you get that if you use a PRF-based construction or if you use HMAC or whatever, okay? Pretty much all the Macs you want are giving you strong affordability. Okay, next then, so, okay, so this is what we'd like to use, right? We get AE security, job done. We can all go home. I wouldn't be here giving this lecture if this is what everybody was using in the real world. Okay, I'd be out of a job, actually, which would be kind of sad. So it's good, it's good. That, you know, it's an employment scheme. Okay, E and M. Uh, e and M stands for encrypt and MAC. So here, what you do is you encrypt your message, and then you MAC your message. So you encrypt the plain text, as you would expect, but then you also MAC the plain text. And this is not even CPA secure in general, because MAC on plain text might leak the plain text. If you give me an unforgeable MAC, I can make a new unforgeable MAC scheme, whose output is the original MAC tag together with the plain text. It's still unforgeable but it completely leaks the plain text. Okay? So there are Macs that are secure as Macs that don't provide any confidentiality properties for their, for their plain texts, for their messages. I mean, why would you expect that? A Mac is an integrity object or an integrity scheme. It's not, uh, it's not, a com not meant to provide confidentiality. Okay? Nevertheless, uh, specific instantiations can be proved secure. So there's a paper by Bellari, Kono, and Nampenpre 
from 2002 where they analyze SSH, and SSH actually uses an encrypt and MAC construction, but there the MAC is a PRF. Okay, and if the MAC is a PRF, then, and some other things hold, you can prove uh, AE security. Well, kind of. You need to be probabilistic, though. Hey? You need also the probabilistic, you need to be probabilistic, you need to change for, different, for the same message. Uh, yeah, that's true. So their scheme has, the, the schemes they analyze have random padding, so the message is changing every time, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're right, good point. Can it be p-text? Can it be? P-text. It p-text? I don't know. Uh, yes, yes, because if you, yeah, because the Mac is on the, yeah, the Mac is on the plain text, so it's, it's easy to see that you have in p-text. Yeah. Okay, then the third one, Mac then encrypt. So here what we do is we Mac our plain text, <coughs> get a Mac tag, and then we encrypt the plain text together with the Mac tag. So we're encrypting our Macs. Okay? And people wanted to do this in the 90s because they weren't really very sure about their Mac algorithms. And because some guy called Bruce Schneier, I don't really know who he is, but he, he said something like, um, you should really map your plain text because you need to integrity protect the thing that you're saying, the, thing that, the real meaning of your message should be integrity protected. Okay? So, uh, and then they wrote a book, uh, Bruce Schneier wrote a book with, uh, uh, what's his name? Ferguson. Ferguson, Niels Ferguson, who's now with Microsoft. And they had an entire chapter on encrypt then Mac or Mac then encrypt. And they kind of came down on the side of Mac then encrypt in the end. And then lots of people read their book and that's what people thought was a good thing to do. It's actually the wrong thing to do. Uh, I almost had a fist fight with Niels Ferguson at Crypto this year, last year, about you know, what the right thing to do is. Um, he's an interesting character. And the reason it's not the right thing to do because it's not CCA secure in general. Okay? Uh, so, uh, as an exercise during the coffee break, construct a separating example. In fact, we already did it. Uh, basically, it's the idea of Mac, then, in, then encrypt, with a redundant bit in the ciphertext. Of course, then what the practitioners say is, ah, oh, but that's such an artificial example. Our schemes don't do that, we're okay. Again, what I'll convince you of in the second and third sessions is that it's not okay in general. Okay, now, for this Mac, then encrypt, it's easy to show that you have in CPA, um, and you also get in ptech security for this composition. Okay, and you might think, well, that's good enough for secure channel applications. All right, in ptech is, is, is good enough to get it in CPA, but I'll argue in the rest of, in the rest of these lectures that it's not really good enough. Um, and part of the reason for that is, I'm actually cheating here, okay? So you, you can prove that pure Mac then encrypt is in CCA secure in certain cases. So there's a paper by, by Hugh Kravchik from 2001 where he says, well, if the encryption scheme is CBC mode, and if you don't do any padding, and if your Mac tags are the same size as your blocks of your block cipher, then CBC mode followed by, sorry, Mac followed by CBC mode is secure. And he also proves that uh, Mac followed by a secure stream cipher is secure, provides AE. Okay, so there's, in special cases, you can prove this thing is good. But in general, you can't. There are separating examples. And part of the problem here is that people will read this result of, of Hugo's and think, well, that's good. I've got NCCA security. I'm good to go. But the real systems they build are rarely pure Mac and encrypt. Because in the real world, you have to worry about padding. You have to worry about initialization vectors and all these other things that are going to trip you up. Okay? So in theory, Mac and encrypt can be OK. But in practice, it's really hard to get it, to get it right. I have a question at the back. Everything I just said. <laughs> Did I say encrypt and Mac? Oh, what's the problem with encrypt and Mac? Nothing. It achieves AE security. So it's only a philosophical reason to use it. I mean, why should to use the bad version? Oh, 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 because, okay. So um, let me expand just, just for. Just saying the reason to use the other mode is that you have a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah to, keep, to, keep me in, to keep me in business. No, it's because back in the 90s, when people were designing SSL and IPsec and so on, this theory didn't exist. Valerian Nampren Prey was only 2000, Kravchik was 2001. Okay, one sec, one sec. Um, it was already too late because they had decided what they were doing. And once they'd made that decision, it's incredibly hard to change. So right now, for example, in 2013, after all the attacks on TLS in the last year, but I'll talk about this afternoon, um, 
there's a big, there was a big discussion on the TLS mailing list, this ITF mailing list, about whether we should introduce Mac then encrypt, or whether we should get rid of Mac then encrypt, or just introduce encrypt then Mac. And there were people who were still arguing for Mac then encrypt, because we understand that we can deploy easily, blah, 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 blah. So there's all kinds of issues around deployment and uh, legacy and resistance to change, and also lack of understanding. So people, for example, like the idea of Mac then encrypt, as I said, because you're macking your plain text. And Bruce says that's the right thing to do. Okay? And also, maybe we don't trust our Mac algorithms that much, so it's better to encrypt our Mac tags, because then they virtually can't even see the Mac tag. Right? This is the kind of argument you get into. Yeah? So, uh, do you want to say something? Sorry. Yeah, I think historically, the reason was that people used before, people used Mac, people used error detection codes. Ah. And they had this hope that if they do error detection code, and then they do something like CPC, yeah. they can also provide that's, yeah. that's a good one, yeah. And in fact, you can see an example of that in the WEP standard, wireless encryption, wireless equivalent privacy, where, yeah, where they used a 32-bit used CRC to try to provide integrity. But the CRC doesn't have any key, and it's linear, it's a linear function of all the point text bits, and yeah, you can trash it, basically. Okay. What about Mac and encryption? Who said that? <laughs> okay, no chocolate for you today at all. <laughs> That's a stupid idea. Okay. So MTE is okay. Sometimes it's provably secure. Uh, sometimes it's okay to use, but it's hard to use it securely, and we'll talk a lot about that later on. Okay. So before we go for coffee, I wanted to share some philosophy with you about all of this. Models are just models, right? In CPA, in CTEX, blah blah blah. And actually, reality is different from these models and very hard to model. So what we try to do is we build uh, conservative models with strong adversaries. And we hope. We cross our fingers at that point. Okay? And um, in fact, realizing these adversarial capabilities, like decryption oracle, might be pretty tough for an attacker to do in practice. Okay? And that has an interesting consequence when you talk to people in the real world. It can be hard to convince them that they should actually be worried about your, say, your chosen plain text distinguishing attack. The fact that you can distinguish the encryption of some carefully chosen M0 from some carefully chosen M1, okay, with two to the 50 encryption oracle queries or something, um, isn't really going to keep them awake at night. Okay? But the counterpoint to that is also they tend to need to see plain text and a working exploit, proof of concept. Okay? So you have to actually build a demo get them to type in their password, and then show them their password. Right? Then they get convinced. I mean, I have direct experience with that process of actually convincing people by showing them their passwords. It's pretty effective, actually. <laughs> okay? But on the flip side of this is that attacks only get better, or worse, depending on your perspective, with time. Okay? So an attack that starts off as a chosen plain text distinguishing attack can be turned into, sometimes, if you're lucky or unlucky, <coughs> depending on your point of view, can be turned into a full plain text recovery attack. And I'm going to show you examples in the next session of exactly that process in action, where <coughs> Phil Rogaway in 1995 pointed out a problem with chained IVs or predictable IVs that led to a distinguishing attack, and eventually that turned into full plain text recovery. <coughs> but it took 16 years for that to happen. Okay? Okay. So I think uh, it seems also that every practitioner needs to learn this lesson the hard way, right? Every individual practitioner has to be shown his own password <laughs> before, they, before they get convinced that these security models are the right way to think about things, okay? This is, there's a big battle going on here between, uh, between theory and practice, actually. I'm not saying that theory has all the answers. So let's briefly look at this picture again. This is the NCCA security model, okay? And what I would like you to think about during the break, and come back to me afterwards with this, what's wrong with this model? What's missing? Or what's an over-approximation, what's an under-approximation? Okay, it's a difficult thing because, you know, as, as, uh, as we were saying on Monday, your toolbox isn't that big yet, right? So you don't know all the things maybe that are missing from this model. But have a think and see, maybe you have some ideas already, what's missing from this picture in the real world. Sorry? Sizes. Hiding sizes, excellent. Okay, so I didn't actually say this anywhere, but in all of the models, we assume that M0 has the same size as M1. Okay, but the message yes is a different length from the message no. One is three bytes, the other is two bytes. If you encrypt that with a stream cipher, that length leaks, 
right? So you might want to consider how can I hide the length of messages. Another clue, we always assume that this decryption algorithm leaks only the message or a failure symbol. In reality, when we implement decryption algorithms, maybe they leak timing information, or you know, uh, maybe there's more than one error message that comes back which, which leaks further information about, about what's going on inside the box. Okay? And there are lots and lots of other things that I want to try to introduce you to in the, in the later sessions about why this model is not complete. You also know that in CCA, does not imply any integrity motion. Okay, it's another way this picture, this diagram is not complete. We need some kind of integrity for a secure channel. So, did anybody want to add anything to what we discussed just before the break? Why this model is not the whole story? What else is missing? Lighter, please. Oh, yeah, side information about the key. Yeah, good. Maybe the key, some bits of the key leak, or yeah, good. We, Sorry? Bad randomness. Bad randomness. Ah, that's an excellent. So look, the randomness doesn't appear anywhere explicitly in this model, but clearly uh, we need random IVs for CBC mode. We need a, a random counter value for, uh, for the counter mode, this, the basic counter mode that I showed you. What if that randomness isn't to be trusted? What if it's been subverted in some way, or maybe by your friendly intelligence agency? Or maybe you've just got a bad PRNG, a bad random number right? That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> the time it takes to respond to Oracle queries, right, the amount of time that decryption takes might leak something about the underlying message. And we'll see examples of that, in, particularly in TLS, in a little while. Yeah? Good? Good? Maybe that's enough. There's a bunch of things that are not in this model that actually matter in the real world. So models are just models, and reality is different. And modeling reality is hard. You know this famous saying? That in theory, uh, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they're not. Mm -hmm. you, all, you all heard that before? In theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they're not. Um, I used to think that was uh, Lars Knudsen, who was the first person who said that, but apparently it goes way back to the 19, 1930s or something. So, to my point of Okay, so what we're going to do now, if I can put my hand on the clicker, here we go.